Anaximander. This is a beautiful little uh, marble carving of Anaximander. Um, he was part of the Miletus school, so he was living in the same part of Greece, this Asia Minor coast, um, and he studied with Thales, so he's the next generation, may have known Pythagoras, that is the two of them may both have been students at the school of Thales, and followed the ideas of Thales. So you're beginning a kind of apostolic succession in which the ideas of one master in the 600s will be handed on to the next generation, somewhat younger, and then they will train other people th who will then train. And so it will go all the way through now to the uh, essential philosophy of Plato and Aristotle. So, so by 350, you have this tremendous accretion of ideas and thinking and studies being added together, added together, and people studying them. Uh, and there are many other names. So Pythagoras is a name that we all know. And Pythagoras may have been a student of Thales. We think it's a good chance. Samos, he comes from the island of Samos, and that's just off the coast. He would have known Thales, and he would know Anaximander and other, uh, other uh, students of philosophy. And, uh, and so Pyth Pythagoras is uh, one of the best known of this group of philosophers, particularly because of mathematics and music, both, and the fact that he uh, established a major school. That is, he intentionally, consciously set up a philosophical school. Uh, he based it in Italy. He went to Italy because that's a Greek part of the Greek diaspora. So he went to Italy, the south coast of Italy, set up a school, very popular. Lots of people came from all over the Greek world to study with him uh, and essentially began what we would now call the Pythagorean uh, school or the Pythagorean uh, cult, really, because he was way more than just a philosopher. He was an artist, he was a musician, and he was a philosopher of religion. And so Pythagoras is one of the most powerful of all these I individuals, and particularly with his accent on mathematics and numbers as the secret to the universe. That was his idea. This idea will recur again and again and again during our studies here this year. Uh, we will come back to this again and again and again. And uh, philosophers in the 16th and 17th and 18th century will say exactly this. Uh, to Pythagoras and to his school, uh, there was the idea that with mathematics, you could understand the whole universe. So you learned the language of the universe by studying mathematics. With mathematics, you could understand the unity of the whole universe. And so uh, uh, it was um, related to mathematics and numbers and the, uh, as the ultimate reality. It was said that he was the first man to call himself a philosopher. That, that may have been true. A lover of wisdom, that's what it means. And that Pythagorean ideas um, exercised a huge influence over Plato. This is, this is the most important part of this, that Pythagoras, in these early years, is already constructing a vision of the reality that will be very, very uh, welcome to the generation of Aristotle and Plato. That is an abstract world that explains the material world, that behind the material world, there's an abstract world that explains everything. Here's the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which you all know. I'm sure you could all repeat it. I bet I could take it off the screen, and all of you could just repeat it right out loud. Uh, it is, uh, will, will be part of Euclidean geometry uh, with the three sides of a right triangle. It states the square of the hypotenuse, that's the side of the, of the uh, angle, is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So it's very, very easy. You see it up there. The big one will be equal to the other two. This, of course, idea will be incorporated by later philosophers, including Euclid, um, A, B, C. And here's a nice little uh, drawing. I, I, like, I like this one because it has color in it. You see, you see how, uh, what a philosopher I am? <laughs> well, just imagine, you know, we're looking at something that's 2,500 years old. Uh, 2,500 years old, still true, still used, still, still learned, uh, still part of, uh, of what we 
work with and think about. That's pretty amazing that when you think about it, that 2,500 years ago, this insight is there, and it's still part of what we know and learn. And then another one of the pre-Socratics is Democritus, uh, now down into the uh, golden age of the fifth century. The theory of Democritus held that everything is composed of atoms. This is probably the most sophisticated theory that anybody had in their group uh, since it's so true, <laughs> so close to exactly the way we would explain. Um, and in, in, the, in the detail, it's, uh, it's fairly uh, amazing that uh, that early in the evolution of philosophy, we already had someone who uh, was explaining the atomic theater. Then we come to Socrates. Now, everyone else that we've mentioned, all of these philosophers uh, on the Asia Minor coast are creating step by step by step an increasingly detailed picture of the universe, piece by piece by piece. In some cases, it includes astronomical observations. In some cases, it includes materialistic, geometrical observations, uh, musical, mathematical. But by 450, the picture of the universe is becoming richer and richer, and the school of philosophy in Athens is the beneficiary. Why Athens, you would all say? Why Athens? Well, it's not just its location, although that's good because it's in between Asia Minor Coast and Italy, and there are more and more important philosophical activities going on in Sicily and southern Italy, so that's one thing. So location was good. But also, slowly, the uh, advantageous position of the city was drawing people back to Athens after the refugee communities had gone off to other locations in the post-Bronze Age collapse. So slowly, Athens was watching this return of citizens, Greeks, uh, travelers, commercial vendors, import, export, and slowly the capital of Athens was drawing people back. So all of the work we just talked about, which had been going on on the coast of Asia Minor, was now being brought back to Athens and added to schools of philosophy that were existent in Athens. And of course, the most famous person in this story is Socrates, who lives right straight through 70 years um, of the 5th century, born just before the high moment of the Acropolis, born just before the great moment of Pericles, watches the triumph of Athens in the Persian Wars, watches the triumph of Athens uh, in the rebuilding, is part of it. Um, and then, of course, uh, by virtue of his fame and his reputation, uh, pays with his life. In any case, Socrates, as you can see, 470 to 399, lives right through the great age of Athens and will become the most important philosophical teacher in Athens in the 5th century. And out of his school will come Plato. So uh, Plato will lead us to the high point of, uh, of uh, great philosophy. Here's the great... Uh, Jacques-Louis David painting of the death of Socrates. Uh, this is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It's a spectacular painting. Uh, here on our screen, it's much smaller than it is in the museum. It's a very, very big, uh, probably as big as the full screen. Um, spectacular colors, gorgeous, gorgeous uh, painting. And of course, um, a, a amazing and important moment for Athens in th this almost exactly the year 400, uh, in uh, this symbolism of the tension between philosophy and politics, philosophy and society. If philosophers were going to raise uncomfortable questions, what would be the reaction of society? And in this case, we see it. So uh, it's, a, it's a great to story for uh, for us tonight, and this brings us to Aristotle.